So now we've looked at the theory behind a lot of rectifier circuits, I wanted to end the course with practical design examples. So what we're going to do for this lecture is we're going to design a rectifier given some performance parameters. And so for this example, we've been given an input voltage of 230 volts RMS at 50 Hertz. And we have to design the rectifier such that the output voltage ripple is no greater than 20 volts peak to peak. And the output current ripple is no greater than 2 amps peak to peak. And the output load is a 5 ohms resistor. And the reason why I chose 230 volts for this example is that for most of the examples that we looked at during the course, I used a 120 volts at 60 hertz input voltage, which is the typical household voltage in the United States. And so I wanted to use something different for this example just to illustrate how the theory can apply to any input voltage. And so I chose a typical European household voltage, which is 230 volts at 50 hertz. Now we haven't been given any type of constraint for the type of rectifier that we can use. So the most logical option would be to use a full wave rectifier, which gives us the best output voltage without having to use any capacitors or inductors. However, since we've been given performance criteria for the output voltage and current, we're going to have to add and choose values for the capacitors and inductors at the output such that we meet the performance requirements. So let's go ahead and draw the circuit for this rectifier. So as you can see, I've drawn a full wave rectifier with a capacitor for voltage filtering and an inductor for current filtering. So let's go ahead and write down the parameters that we've been given. We've said that Vn is equal to 230 volts RMS at 50 hertz. So let's compute what the peak voltage would be for the input voltage. And so remember that the peak of a RMS voltage is equal to the voltage times square root of 2. So for this case, the peak of the input voltage would be 325.269 volts. And also let's compute the frequency of the input voltage in radians per second. So remember that the frequency omega is equal to 2 pi f, f being 50, which is equal to 314.159 radians per second. And so knowing that the input voltage is 50 Hz, we can compute the period of one cycle. So T would be equal to 1 over 50 or 1 over the frequency. So this is equal to 20 milliseconds. So the input voltage repeats every 20 milliseconds. So let's draw what the input voltage would look like. So the input voltage will look like this. It has a period of 20 milliseconds and a peak magnitude of 325.27, let's say, volts. And so remember that for a full wave rectifier with a capacitive filter, the output voltage looks like this. So if I draw the fully rectified signal in dashes, then the output voltage will look like this. It's going to decay, then it's going to charge, decay again and charge again and this is going to repeat. Now from the parameters that we've been given we know a couple things. Remember that the peak of the output voltage is going to be the same as the peak of the input voltage. So we know that this voltage right here is 325.27 volts. And since we've been given a parameter that the output voltage ripple cannot be greater than 20 volts peak to peak, we know that this point right here cannot be less than 305.269 volts. And just like in the previous example that we looked at with the capacitive filter, let's define this point right here as T1. And we know that a quarter cycle is going to be 5 milliseconds, half a cycle is going to be 10 milliseconds, and a full cycle is going to be 20 milliseconds. In other words, since we know that the peak of the input voltage is 325.269 volts, which means that the peak of the output voltage is also that. And we know that we have to design the circuit such that the maximum output voltage ripple is no greater than 20 volts peak to peak. Then we know that the minimum of the output voltage cannot be lower than 305.27 volts.
And so in order to do this, what we can do is that since we know that the dashed line and the output voltage is of the form Vs sine omega t, then we can set that equal to 305 volts. In other words, we would see when the input voltage equals that, and then we can solve for t in that equation to get t1. So now that's a little bit confusing, so let's run through the math. So again, looking at the dashed voltage and the output voltage graph that I've drawn, we know that that's of the form V out equals the peak voltage magnitude, so 325.269 volts, sine the frequency, which is 314.159 T in volts. And so we want to see where this is equal to 305.269 volts, which would be at the point T1. And so if we solve for T in this equation, we will get that T1 is equal to 3.87796 milliseconds. Now knowing what T1 is equal to, then we can use that to calculate the size necessary for capacitor C1 in order to make the output voltage ripple at least 20 volts peak to peak or lower. So remember that we know then that this point right here would be equal to 10 plus T1. So it would be equal to 13.87796 milliseconds. And also remember from the previous lecture that the voltage at this point, so from 5 milliseconds until 10 plus T1, is of the form e to the minus T over tau, where tau is the time constant of a circuit, which is equal to RC. And so in other words, we know that the voltage at that time from 5 milliseconds until 10 plus T1 is equal to 325.269 e to the minus t minus 5 milliseconds so 5 times 10 to the minus 3 and remember that the 5 milliseconds comes from the fact that the decaying exponential function doesn't start until 5 milliseconds in other words once the capacitor starts discharging and so over tau which will be equal to rc so will be, will be equal to 5c in this case since r is equal to 5 and then we want to see when that voltage is equal to 305.269 volts. In other words, we know that from this point until 10 plus T1, the output voltage is this function right here. And we want to see when that's equal to 305.269 volts because that will tell us this point right here. And so to do that, we can say that T is equal to 10 plus T1. So T is equal to 13.87796 milliseconds. And then now we can solve for C. So if we do all this math and we solve for C and calculate it, we get that C would be equal to 27.9801 millifarads. So in other words, if we have a capacitor that's at least 27.98 millifarads, then we can guarantee that the output voltage ripple is 20 volts peak to peak or lower. So obviously in practical design applications, you would go with the next higher standard value. So let's say that for this case, we're going to choose a capacitor that is 28 millifarads. And so choosing that will guarantee you is that the output voltage ripple is lower than 20 volts peak to peak. So next, we want to size the inductor L1 such that the output current ripple is lower than 2 amps peak to peak. And that's a little bit more tricky because now we know that the output voltage is this strange waveform that I've drawn in orange. And so in other words, we know that V out of T is going to be equal to the following. It's going to be equal to 325.269 sine 314.259. 0.159 T volts, but that's from T1, so from 3.87796 milliseconds to 5 milliseconds. And then we know that the upward voltage is equal to 325.269 E to the minus T minus 5 milliseconds. over tau, which in this case would be RC, and then we, if we calculate RC, we would get that it's equal to 0 0.14. And this is from 5 milliseconds 
to the end of the cycle. So let's say that 13.87796 milliseconds. And so I, I kind of skip one step, but tau is equal to RC, which is equal to 5 times 28 times 10 to the minus 3, which is C. So tau is equal to 0 0.14 seconds. That's where this 0 0.14 seconds came from. And so I'm going to erase a few things here to make some room. And so the reason why it's important that we define V out in terms of these functions is that remember that the voltage across an inductor is given by VL equals L di dt. And so remember that VL would be this voltage right here. And so we can write V out as V out is equal to VL plus the voltage across the resistor, so the voltage right here, which is equal to I out R. So this would then be equal to L di out dt plus I out R. And so in order for us to be able to calculate I out, we need to know what V out is in terms of functions. And so that's tricky to do when you have a function that is defined in two separate types of functions like we have here for V out. So we have one part of the waveform which is equal to a sinusoid and then another part of the waveform which is equal to the decaying exponential function. So we need to be able to write down a continuous function for V out in order to calculate I out in this differential equation that I've stated here. And so a way to do that is to write V out in terms of what's called a Fourier series expansion, which is basically a way to define a periodic waveform in terms of cosines and sines. And that's a little bit outside of the scope of this course, but basically what you can do is you can write any type of periodic waveform as the sum of cosines and sines. And so what I did is I calculated the Fourier series expansion for this periodic waveform V out and I came out with the following equation. And so basically what I've done is I define V out in terms of cosines and sines and I get the following equation which closely resembles the V out that we've defined previously with sines and decaying exponential functions. And so again calculating the Fourier series expansion is kind of outside of the scope of this course but just in case you're interested, I've included in the notes for this lecture the calculation of the Fourier series coefficients, which is where these numbers and this equation come from. And so if you're interested, take a look at that. And that's going to walk you through how to write V out in terms of cosines and sines so that then you can use that in the differential equation to solve for I out. And so using this equation for V out, we can write the following differential equation to calculate I out. So we can say that d i out over dt is going to be equal to v out minus 5 i out over L. So the 5 comes from the resistor R1 value, which is 5 ohms. And so we can solve this differential equation and plot it to see how the size of the inductor L affects the output current ripple. And so you can use any type of differential equation solver out there to calculate I out and then plot it to see what the output current ripple is. And that's what I did and I used MATLAB and in case you're interested in how to do that in MATLAB, I'm also adding the code that shows how to define the differential equation, how to set the initial condition for the differential equation, and then how to plot the solution. And so what I found is that for this example, a inductor value of 10 millihenry gives me a ripple that's slightly lower than 2 amps peak to peak. And so I hope that this example shows you how to use the theory that we've learned throughout the course and in practical design examples to achieve certain performance parameters and rectifier designs.